We are uh, in week three of Your Mess Matters. How many of you had a mess this week? Say amen. amen. Yeah. How many of you feel like you live in one? Amen. Okay, now, now we, knowing this, that we, we all kind of feel this way. Over the last first week, we talked about being healthy, having rest, those kind of things. Last week, we talked about emotional intelligence, being able to understand that maybe not everything is, is you, maybe just a circumstance or situation around you. This week, I want to talk, I just want to ask you a simple question this week. The question I say, it's a simple question. The the words of the question are simple, but the answer is maybe a little heavier. Uh, And the question is simply this, what what do you want? What what do you want? And and I know it's really broad, really vague. There could be a, what what do I want about what? Pastor Vince, what I, I want I want happiness. And, and as I was walking through some of the general answers that I, I would assume some of us would have, and myself included in this, because I don't even know that, that I've really processed through what I want. And, and so as we start walking through this today, uh, it's almost going to feel like two sermons. That's why I got to hurry. I told the worship team, I'm like, I want you to worship Jesus. Can you do it fast? Um, <laughs> And so uh, we're going to do our best to get through as much of this as we can. We are going to continue probably in the coming week uh, this Your Mess Matters. We were going to break it off today, but I just feel there's some topics we still haven't touched on that we need to. And so uh, what, what do you want? Well, I, I know in my life I, I have control over some of the things that I want, but I don't have control over other things. Uh, I, I want to I be healthy but healthy is really a moving target. Can I get an amen on that? Like, I, I feel like you can get healthier, but it doesn't mean you're necessarily healthy. I feel like there are 17,000 different diet options. You, you can count calories. You can count carbs. You can fast. You can starve. You can, you can exercise. I mean, good grief. There's a million options out there. And, and it really just depends on who you talk to. I love that in real life church, some of you are very fit. Very fit, and I love it because we have trainers in each service. And so I'll go talk to a trainer. They're like, what are you doing? How are you losing weight? And so I'll tell them how I'm losing weight, and they're like, whew, I don't know about that one. Like, well, what do you recommend? This one. And then the next service, somebody else will be like, but there's this one also. And so really, I leave church on Sunday confused about what I'm supposed to be doing because there's so many different options. And then how many of you know this person? Like this person that smokes from the time they are four years old to the time they're 107 and they eat bacon every day with Dr. Pepper. And they're killing the game. Like, I mean, they just, they're hopping out of bed, hauling hay at 94. And they're like, I don't know about all that exercise stuff. (sighs) What? Like I have considered that as one of my diet options. I'm like... (laughs) It's working for some of these people. You know, so I, it's just moving this idea of health. Wealth is another one. What do you want? I, want? I want to be wealthy. But what is that? Used to, if you had $50,000, it was wealthy. Now, if you have $50,000, you get to fill up your gas tank once. <laughs> Can't buy a house. Somebody sent me an article, it was like, uh, when it was back in the 50s, and, and there was a, like a sale on cars. No, it was a Mustang, the new Mustang had just came out, 65. And so, uh, 64, the ad came out, and all this stuff about the Mustang, and, and the price on it was like under five grand for a new one. And now, literally, you can't get your brakes fixed for that if you have brake problems. And so, like, what wealth is so relative People go, well, and, and actually, if you ask people that have a lot of money, they spend most of their time trying to figure out either how to keep it or make it turn into more money. Because there's not really a place where we say, what do you want? You can't put an amount on what do I want. Well, if I had a million dollars, if most of us had a million dollars, you'd be gone within a year. You don't believe me? Go ahead and do some statistical study on the lottery. It's amazing how quickly you can burn through that stuff buying silly things. Like Amazon, if I won the lottery... <laughs> I'm just telling you. I'm just, I, would have, I would have glasses with windshield wipers on them. I am that kind of guy. All right? And I know myself, okay? I know myself. Uh, so I have to, I know I'd stay away from some of that stuff. But not all, happiness, wealth, health, safety, security. I just want to be secure. So little of that depends on me and you. 
I mean, you can do some things to protect yourself, but in reality, I mean, how many car accidents happened that no one, nobody got up that morning going, you know, I think I'm going to have a car wreck today. It was just out of their control. It's a moment they didn't see coming. And so safety in and of itself is kind of a fallacy. I mean, we can, we can do our best. The reality at the end of the day, so much of it is, is outside of what we can control. So what do you, what do you want? What do you want that you can actually do something with? I feel like um, as I was looking through this, and I heard a pastor preach this, and so I want to just kind of walk through some of the things. He said, he said there, I believe there are four levels of what do you want in life. Four levels of it. And I, and I think sometimes as I, he was walking through that, I started laughing. I was like, man, this is so real. This fits and makes perfect sense. This idea that these four levels exist. The first level most of us understand, and I pray you're not still here, all right? But this first level is simply, what do you think you want? What do you think you want? And this happens when we're little, and we want to be firemen, or we want to be an astronaut, or we want to be a professional athlete, we want to be a ballerina. I never wanted to be a ballerina, but I'm just saying I want to make sure it's uh, uh, inclusive for everybody. Whatever you thought you wanted to be, when you were little and you had this dream of what you wanted to be. And some people dream a lot longer. And so if you're 35 in your parents' basement and you're still hoping to be a ballerina, you may want to process through that a little bit. Okay, because what happens in that stage is we don't, we don't think about the cost or the investment required to be those things. I have a son-in-law that's in med school right now and a daughter in law school right now. And, of course, that was one of the things when I was young. You want to be a doctor or a lawyer? I'm watching them right now. They don't do anything but read books and articles and study. I have changed my mind. I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a lawyer. I'm really glad somebody else is doing that. Because I never really thought about the investment that it takes to do that. But I'm glad somebody is following through with it. And so I, I, as a professional athlete, people go, man, I want to be a professional athlete. But then no one ever wants to blow up someone's dream because we live in America and it's the land of the dreams. And so your kid is a pretty good athlete and you're like, man, one of these days, one of these days. I, my mom believed this about me that I was going to play professional baseball. And I loved baseball when I was younger. I still love it now. I'm more of a fan now than a participant because I'm wise and I know my body won't work the same way if I tried. But I can remember being 18, 19 years old, coming out of high school, and my mom going, I just wish you'd, I just wish you'd keep chasing baseball. And I'm like, Mom, listen, out, listen, out of tw- <laughs> there are about 2,500 kids that take baseball from high school to the next level. And then out of that massive amount of college athlete, only about 2,500 do anything beyond that. And then it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller from the minor leagues to the different levels of the minor leagues to actually make it to the major league level. I'm just, I love you, mom. And I appreciate so much that you think that your average son could play professional sports, but that's your job as a mom to believe that way. And so I appreciate it, but I was 20 some years old, hadn't played baseball in years. My mom and dad lived in Ohio, right outside Cincinnati. And so I get, we pull in the driveway. I hadn't seen my mom. She walks outside and she says, hey Vince. And I'm like, yeah. She said, the Cincinnati Reds are holding open tryouts. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, mom, I'm not going. I'm not. Well, you never know what could happen. I seen this movie with Disney where there was this guy, he was a baseball coach and he started pitching. And I'm like, it ain't, it ain't me, mom. I'm a pit- I wasn't a pitcher. I was mediocre at best. And I'm okay with that. It's not what God called me to do. But, you know, what do you think you want to be? It's that younger stage where we're not really thinking about all that goes into it. It's also something that we're not really bent out of shape if we don't achieve. Like, you could be president one day. Please, God, no. <laughs> right? Now, I mean, at one time we used to go, man, I want to be president. Now we're like, nobody wants that job. Because it doesn't matter what you do. You, you can't win. You're, 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 you're not going to win either way. Somebody's going to be mad at you. Whether you do everything right or everything wrong, somebody's going to be mad. So we don't think about that anymore. And I pray again as I'm talking to this service and I'm looking out over the crowd, I feel like probably most of you have moved out of the what do you think you want to be? What do you think you want in your life? Again, no, no investment, no cost. You, you're not thinking, it's just a dream. It's a wish. 
But then we step up in age and maturity and we kind of fall into this, what are you supposed to want in life? What are you supposed to want? And this is where we come into things like a career and a spouse and security and retirement and safety and good health and, and I want to be a contributor into society and I want my character to be good things and, and I, I want to make sure that, that, that I got my house ready and, I, and have, we're either renting or we're buying and it's always better to buy unless it makes more sense to rent and, and it never makes more sense to rent. I can see the room split right now. And so we, we think through these things that we're supposed to want. Here's the thing. This is the season that a bunch of people get stuck in. Because this is the season where you chase. You're chasing approval. From who? I don't know. Who told you you had to have all those things? Who, who, told, who told you those were the most important things in life? Who told you that, that, that owning your home was the most important? Who told you that this career was going to be the one that set you up? Who told you that? These are the things that are most critical. These people are continually chasing, and I don't know whose approval it is. Maybe, maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's the culture that surrounds you that says you got to keep doing this because you haven't reached this level yet. What level? The level that you're supposed to reach. I don't know what that is. We don't either, but you're supposed to ch keep chasing after it. You're supposed to have a retirement house. And if you have a retirement house, you should probably be looking for another retirement house somewhere in the Gulf somewhere. That'd be nice down there. But if you're not a water person, maybe in the mountains, then you can have a retirement place in the mountains, but you got to have your regular place that you live in so you don't too, look too auspicious. I mean, you want to just, you want to be relatable. So just keep chasing these things that you're supposed to chase. This career, it pays good. So that's why we do it, right? Because it pays good. Well, that makes sense. I got to have money to pay bills. And so I'm going to keep paying bills. Why? Because bills are bills and they're going to keep coming. So I've got to have something to pay the bills. Is that what you want? Doesn't matter what I want. This is what I'm supposed to do. And we go through life explaining to people that we're so glad we live in America because it's the place of the American dream. But we, we took the American expectation rather than the American dream. And a lot of people get stuck right here. You know how I know? <laughs> My dad is there. And I don't say that as an insult. It's a reality for most of our culture that we get stuck right here. My dad retired from Sears. Gosh, now it's been almost 15 years ago. And has no idea what to do. Any retirees in the room, you're sitting in the same place where you're like, I retired, but man, I got no idea what to do. Like, I got to do something. I, gotta, I mean, I got to go do something. What? Why? Could, because I do. But why? Don't ask again, Pastor Vince. I've got a vein that's going to pop out right in my head right here because I don't know the answer to that question. And it's, it's okay. It's, it's, it's a reality to our culture that says we go, 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 go. And you're supposed to go, 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 go until you die. And, and then how do we know? Well, you're dead. That's how we know it's the end. You can't go, go, go anymore once that happens. But Culturally, that's what we're supposed to do, right? I love hard work. We, we talk about it often. As a, it's, a, it's a work ethic mindset that we, 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 I tell people all the time, I'll give you plenty of time. If you work higher on at Real Life Church, I'll give you plenty of time through the week to get done what you need to get done so that you don't, you, you don't have to be here when you don't have to be here. But if you don't work in the time that you're given, any extra time is your fault, not mine. It's, it's, I, if you're up here way past when you need to be, if you're losing time, it's not because you don't have enough time, it's because you're not working in the time allotted. So I, understand, I appreciate work. I started driving illegally when I was 14 to go to work. Okay? You can blame my parents. It was them, not me. <laughs> and I loved it. I worked, I worked at Fred's Fish House, bussing tables. It's good stuff, man. The waitresses were required to tip the bus boys. Because the busboys cleaned their tables. And if the tables weren't cleaned, we couldn't see them at the waitress's table. So once I figured that out, I knew which waitresses tipped me better than the other waitresses. And they had nice tables. But I started working. That's how you work. But also, you guys remember a few weeks ago when I sat there and I said, when I'm staring at my doctor going, I don't know how to rest. 
We do a real good job of teaching what you're supposed to do, but we forget the flip side of that, that God has a plan that might be, that might be different. What are you supposed to do? I'm supposed to, 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 to retire. I'm supposed to have a career. I'm supposed to have a spouse. I'm supposed to not mess that up. And if I mess that up, then people are going to think weird about it, but I'll try again. And then 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 I'll try again. And we spend, a lot of people spend so much time in this portion of their life that even at the end of it, they feel like they're just trying again. I'll try it again. I'll try this. Maybe that didn't work. I'll try this. That didn't work. I'll try this. And this is a tough one because, like I said, this is the majority, I think, of people. If I, if I were to select all three of our services today, this is, this is the window that I believe we get stuck in. There are a few maybe still in that dreamer stage that's early. That the sky's the limit and you're going to chase it and I love you for it. I'm a dreamer myself. Okay? But also there's this flip side of me that has this reality, this supposed to thing that I've got to do these things. And, and, and I'm bad about it, especially now that I'm getting the age that I'm at, at at 46. I'm running through the numbers in my head going 46, 10 more years, I'm 55, 15 more years, I'm, I'm 60. Oh, do I want to retire? Am I supposed to re- Can preachers retire? start thinking about this. I'm like, wait, I don't know. I think I'm supposed to die up here. I think that's the plan because that's what I heard old preachers say when I was little. I just want to go out preaching the gospel. And, and I'd kind of like to go out on a beach. <laughs> I mean, I'll preach on the beach, but is it okay if I want that? I don't know. Culturally, I don't know if it's okay if I want that. You say, well, spiritually, I don't know if it's okay if you want that. Well, we'll get to you folks in a minute. What are you supposed to want? I think most of you probably have a list already in your mind. What are you supposed to want? The third person, the third level is something that's a minority. It's definitely a small cross-section of people. And in, in this group of people, the only way I knew how to write it down was, what do you truly want? And these people are rare. They no longer need approval. They're not chasing anymore. They're not chasing the dollar. They're not chasing approval. They're not chasing status. They're not chasing a name. They're not chasing, they're not chasing anymore. You can tell these people are starting to happen because they do something really well. They use the word no. No, I don't have to do that. What what do you mean? You know, can, can I get your help? No. No? No. Why not? Because I'm not doing that. Why not? I ask you to do that. Aren't you supposed to do? If somebody asks you, aren't you supposed to do? Not all the time. Sometimes there's something called the best yes. How many of you know you can say yes to a lot of things? How many of you get stuck saying yes to a lot of things? It's because you don't think about what's the best yes in that moment. The best yes in that moment. See, I can get really busy doing things, but sometimes God really needs me to say no so that I can say yes to the better yes. The better thing, the more important thing, the more critical thing, the more vital thing. Sometimes I don't have time to do that because I've said yes to so many things. These people that have reached this third stage of life, they're okay saying no because they've realized there may be something better. And I don't mean better as in more acceptable. I mean, this may be more efficient, more effective, a greater use of my time than just staying busy all the time. We talk a lot about bandwidth in, in, in staff. And one of the things I tell our, our leaders is that you're going to have people that have bandwidth. They have a lot of time to do whatever you need them to do. But then there are some other people that have capacity and and you can give them a little bit of time and they will get just as much done because of the way they're wired. It's not a good or a bad thing. It's just a wiring thing in individuals. Some people just love to give time and we we love people that love to give time. But then there are also some high capacity people that go, I can give you an hour, but if I give you that hour, don't waste me. How many of you have ever been wasted? (laughs) <laughs> Wait, sorry. <laughs> I'm cha- hold on, I'm going to change that in the notes here. So that we definitely don't want that to come up in the 1130 service. <laughs> so half the room be like, yes. So what I mean is, to clarify, what I mean is how many of you have been in situations where you've been there and you've been available, but you feel like 
your capabilities and your capacity has been wasted because you went, man, if, if I had known this is what I was getting into, I'd have said no so that I could be more useful in a situation like this. It's, a re- it's just a reality. And so when you get to this level, people know how to no- use their nose. They know how to use them. It's not that they say it all the time and they're just grumpy all the time saying no to everything. No. It just no- they know how to use them. I think it's a healthy thing. We as people need to learn how to use no more often. There was time Jesus was like, hey, we- Jesus, we need to go over here and we need-, we need to spend time with these people. And Jesus was like, no. Where are you going? I'm going to go over there in the woods and pray. What? What? Yeah, I'm going to go over there and pray. What do you mean? I mean, I'm going to go over there and pray, and you guys can deal with those people. No, Jesus, you're the Savior. You're the Messiah. I know. And if you want the best version of me, I'm going to go over there and pray. And he would separate himself from the crowds, and he would go over there. So many people don't think about this in our busyness, our busyness, our chaotic lives. Do you realize that Jesus for 30 years was silent? events we got to get all that we can accomplish well the one we follow didn't because what if he'd have started when he was 18 man what would we have done then what would the church look like if jesus would have been a go-getter and started when he was 18 when he would what if he have started then when he was old enough to speak well we've seen him when he was 12 in the temple yeah but that's just kind of a snapshot and then you don't you know that was a talking to all the way home by joseph and mary 30 years he stays quiet and then shows up and for three and a half extremely effective years. We still celebrate it today. Why? Because Jesus, had, being Jesus, he knew how to say no and he knew how to say yes to things. You say, well, Vince, that's all well and good, but you said there were four. Yeah, I just want you to think for a little bit where you're at. What do you want? And do you know why you want it? Do, I mean, do you truly know why you want it? Because I think this, we've been talking about mental health and the fact that our lives are messy. I think the fact that the reason that a lot of our lives are messy is because part of this, what we're talking about today, that we run through chaos so much. We run constantly in this, this rhythm and this pace that is not, it's not reality. We go to bed thinking about stuff. We wake up thinking about stuff. If we ever truly actually fell asleep from thinking about this stuff. We never get accomplished what we feel like we should get accomplished in a day. And some of you get so much accomplished in a day, but because the pace you've ran at your entire life, you don't believe you accomplished anything. How many of you are like that? You finished everything at your list, but when you lay down, you thought of 12 more things you could have added to your list? You're still living in what you're supposed to want. So what's the fourth? We see it in Scripture. And it's so interesting that this comes out because Jesus is actually the one that shows us. And so Jesus has had this life. He's done three years of ministry now, three and a half years of ministry. He's with the disciples, and they were on this journey one night, and they start walking through this garden called Gethsemane. And if you understand what the word Gethsemane is, it's, it was an olive grove, and the word Gethsemane means the oil press. Okay? There would have actually been a press on site in the Garden of Gethsemane to press out olives, to, to kind of sift the olive oil out of the olives. And it would have been a, just a process of pressing, smashing, so that the purest oil is through without anything in it. And Jesus is now in the garden walking through a spiritual press. And we see, we pick up in, excuse me, I want to make sure I get it, Mark chapter 14. I know you've been wondering if I was going to have you open your Bible at all today. Mark chapter 14, verse 32 through 36. I'm going to read it real quick for you. It says, they came to an area called Gethsemane, and Jesus told his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he sank into a pit of suffocating darkness. And he told them, I feel bad enough right now to die. Stay here and keep a vigil with me. And going a little ahead, he fell to the ground and he prayed for a way out. Papa, Father, can you, can't you get me out of this? Take this cup away from me, but please, not what I want. But what do you want? What do you want? You see the shift? And I know it seems elementary. What what does God want? 
from me? That should be ultimately the question that we're asking. I ask you, what do you want? Because typically as people, that's what we filter through first. And then if it works, we'll slide God into the equation. And and if you're offended by that, it's okay. I've offended people before. I just also know in 46 years of ministry and being in and out of church my whole life, this is still the reality. We're going to do what we want and prayerfully God slides into it. Because the idea of asking God what he wants first will take us out of the what are you supposed to want immediately. It will take you out of that immediately. Now, he may bring you back into that kind of culture, but you're, you're going to come back with a different mindset. That's why, God, what Jesus asking in this moment in the garden, what do you want, Father? What is it that you want? And, and, and when Jesus asked me, it's kind of a silly argument at this point or a silly conversation because he already knows. He knows my heart. He knows my arrogance. He knows my selfishness. He knows all those things. So if Jesus were to ask me or God were to ask me, Vince, what do you want? My list gets really silly. Jesus in this moment says, Lord, what I want is this cup to pass from me. But if not, if that's not what you want, then, then what do you want first? Man, this was a hard question because I started thinking through this as a Christian and as a pastor and as a follower of Jesus and as somebody that grew up in vacation Bible school and Sunday school and, and I preach 150 to 200 times a year. Uh, and, and, and so like I th- I've got a pretty good grasp on what the Lord wants. Because I preach on it sometimes. Like he wants, he wants you. He wants your gifts. He wants your talents. He wants, he, wants you to, he wants you to say yes so that you can offer the things that you have to God. And God, as I'm walking through that list, goes, <laughs> that's not what I want. Well, what do you mean, what's not what you want? And he says, Vince, do you hear how arrogant you are? Do you really feel like on Sunday morning I'm sitting in heaven going, I can't wait till Vince gets out there in all his glory and starts telling all these great stories and making people laugh and then he brings it right back around to Jesus and they're crying and oh, I can't wait to see Vince do all that Vince can do for me. But it's what we do, isn't it? We think about him in our relation to what can we offer him? What can I give you, God, that, that will make me enough, that will make, this, that'll make it me enough? And, and we, stop, we don't think about, God, what do you want? Well, what I want is, what do you want? What, and he tries to tell us, and we keep trying to interrupt him with what we want or what we think that he wants. There's been times with my kids, there's been this moment where I've said, hey, if you'll just, and they start answering before I give them the quest, this statement. Any of you ever deal with that? Well, I, yeah, I'll get my room clean. I wasn't going to ask you to clean your room. Okay, I'll get the upstairs clean. I wasn't going to, actually, I was just going to ask, okay, I'll get the trash out. Will you stop for just a second and let me finish the sentence? And I wonder how many times God has heard me babble about all the things I can offer him when he's going, Vince, if you will just be quiet for a second, I'll tell you what I want. The reason, I'm going to tell you, you know why we don't stop? You know why we keep rattling? It's because we're not ready for the answer. We're not ready for the answer because the answer is too overwhelming to us. We cannot, we cannot wrap our minds around it. I'm going to give you three things. To, this is what God wants from you, all right? Real quick, three things that God wants from you. And I'm saying real quick because I'm looking at the clock, but children are just going to have to hang on because some of you need to hear this today. First thing God wants you to do is he wants you to lay down numbers one through three. He wants you to lay down what you think you want. He wants you to lay down what you're supposed to want. He wants you to lay down what you truly want. It doesn't mean you don't get to think about it. It doesn't mean you don't get to talk about it. It doesn't mean you don't even get to dream about it. He just wants you to lay it down and that not be your focus. He wants him to be your focus. He wants you to come after him and say, hey, I just, I, w- God, whatever you want, I'll be fine with. And people go, yeah, but the Bible says God wants to give me the desires of my heart. <laughs> it's great on a coffee cup. It's tough when you study it. 
Because what it means is that you have allowed God to have your heart. And God changes your heart so the desires of your heart become his. And they're the same desires. They're the same desires that you want. And so you're not, you're not saying, Lord, Lord, I wish I had a boat. And God's going, I, what? <laughs> what? Did he say a boat? Yeah, I don't know what he's doing, God. What in the world? No, I need you to be focused on me. If you'll focus on me and if it fits in the plan, the boat's easy. If you'll focus on me and it fits in the plan, the stuff is easy. The hard part is you just giving me you. Just you. No, I know, God, you want my talents. You're not listening, Vince. I don't need how good you can preach because, frankly, there are better. I don't, know how, I don't need how good you can lead because, man, <laughs> I've seen some good ones. And I don't even know if you're in the top ten. I don't need that from you, Vince. God, then what do you need if it's not what I can do with my mouth, if it's not what I can do with my leadership, if it's not what I can do with my influence? God, what do you need? You. I just want you. And so I need you to set down what you think you're supposed to do for me. I need you to set down these lofty dreams and wishes that you hope for me because I don't need them. I am God and there is no one like me. You can't get there with your stuff, Vince. I just want you. Lord, what does that mean? What does that mean? Second thing. He wants you to be present. Okay, just be present. I know it sounds really simple. Let me ask you a question. How many of you remember growing up as a child? Some of you are like, nope, it's too long ago. Uh, you, you lie. Okay, you remember. How many remember summer days when you were little? Bicycles, street stick ball, wiffle ball, football in the park, fishing, river, lake, wherever, however you grew up. How many of you remember those days? How many of you remember how long those days used to seem? Did they? Like it would take forever for my mom to flip the porch light on. It felt like, it felt like I had days within my day. Because, man, as soon as the sun came up, I was on my bicycle, and me and my brother Rob were riding around, and we'd go to the lake for a while. We'd go to, in town. We'd, drive, we'd ride all over the country on those bicycles. Man, even when I got a little older and I was playing baseball in the summer, we'd get on the bus in the morning at 5 o'clock and ride all day to a tournament and play baseball all day long until we couldn't walk at the end of the day. Oh, man, those days took forever. You know why? It's because you were present for everything that happened in that day. You know why they, do you know why they take this long now? It's because you're already thinking about tomorrow and the next day and the next week and on and on and on. And you're not present. Watch creation. The sun rises in the morning, then what does it do? It sets. The tide comes in and then it how many of you have ever worried about the sun rising or setting? Any of you ever sitting there calculating the tides, praying it happens? No. God said, no, no, no. They just do. They're just in this moment doing what I created them to do. And people, we've missed it. We've missed it. This goes back to some of those people that actually know what they truly want. They're, they're learning this ability to go, you know what, I think today, the other day I had my grandbaby at the house and I posted it on Facebook, but the other day, uh, Elena's just over a year old and she's awesome because she's a grandkid and she has no other option. <laughs> but she's laying there on the floor. Jennifer was playing with her. Jennifer said, say, Papa. And she said, Papa. And I thought, this baby's rattling over. She just blah, 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 you know. So I walk over there to her and I lean right over the top of Jennifer and Elena's on the floor and Jennifer's playing with her. She said, say, Papa. And Elena, at one years old, she points up with her finger, points right at my face and says, Papa. And I was done. I didn't care what else happened. Uh, no, listen, listen, I was just done. And some of you understand what I'm talking about. Because every moment around that moment didn't matter. Didn't matter. 
dinner's burning. I don't care. <laughs> House is on fire. We'll get it. Right now, in this moment, I was just present as I could be. I, I didn't need to go anywhere. I, didn't have to, I wasn't thinking about my list. I went, where's the grass going to get mowed? How is this going to... No, I was just in the moment. And I had this moment where there's this connection. And as I'm walking through this sermon, I'm seeing God saying, Vince, I just, if you would just be present with me. God, why do you want me present? Why does that matter? If I'm doing your work, isn't that good? Isn't that good? He said, no, you're still missing the greatest thing. You, you want to really, truly know what I want? Then I need you to be present to experience it. Wait, 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 wait. wait. So being present isn't what you want? No. Laying down one, two, and three isn't what you want? No, you just won't. You won't get to what I want until you do it. Well, then what is number three? I need it. I need to know. And he says, Vince, could you just let me love you? Yeah. Yeah, God, I know you love me. I mean, gosh, God, you've blessed me with family. You've blessed me with, with, my, with health. You've blessed me with sustainability. You've blessed, God, you, I know you love me, God. No, 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 Vince, I just want to love you. I, I just want to love you. Yeah, I know. And, and man, God, because I love you, I want, I'm giving, no, 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 it doesn't matter what you give me. No, it has to matter what I give you, God. It's how it works. No, that's how, that's how you have made it work. That was never my intention. I just want to love you. You were created so that I could love you. You were cre- Your whole purpose on, on this planet, your whole reason for existing is not so I'd have a little army of people that did what I want. It was so that I would have a people that I could pour out my love on. So that I could love them in a way that doesn't make any sense to them. I get so tickled at this. And, and I, I shared this this morning. And I'm going to close, I promise. But here's Jennifer. We'll get our t- we have two teenage boys, Parker and Caleb. Caleb's birthday is today. He's 14 today. Parker's 15. And man, we'll be in the kitchen. And Jennifer, <laughs> I love it when she does it. She'll walk right up to him and just hug him. Whew. How many of you ever tried to hug a teenager? Yeah. Isn't it somewhat like hugging a cactus? Like they don't want it. They're like, oh. oh. And Jennifer, she doesn't just like, she's not in for like the, just the quick squeeze in and out. No, 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 no. She lingers. She like hugs and holds. And you can almost see them. They're uncomfortable like, oh, mom, mom. And then if she leans in to kiss them, it's like, oh. And it's so funny to think about that with a teenager. But the fact that you and I do it to God every time he leans in close to wrap around us. God, no, no, God, you can't. God, don't. No, God, I haven't done enough. God, you don't want to hug me, God, because I got some stuff that you don't want. No, no, I just want to, I just want to hold you. I just want to love you. No, God, you can't. You can't love me like that, God. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't work, God, because I'm broken and I, don't, I haven't brought enough, God. I haven't, I haven't put my offering down and I haven't given you all of my life and I have messed it up. And I've, God, please don't, don't hug me like that. Don't come in close like that, God, please, because I don't think I, I don't deserve it, God. He goes, you never did. That's just what I want for you. I just want to love you so much. And he says it even in John, the most popular verse in all of scripture. He says it that way. For God loved you so much. He didn't just love you. No, he loved you so much that it wouldn't make sense. That you can't wrap your mind around it, but yet, if you're wondering why you exist, if you're wondering and you're overwhelmed about the mess in your life, and I understand it's there, but it's not yours to hang on to. He's saying, come unto me, all ye that are weak and heavy laden, and I just want to love you.